Good. I'm seeing uh, more people attending. It's nice. 28. <clears throat> uh, hello Daniel, uh, okay, I already uh, start streaming. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. My connection is quite slow right now, so uh, I will wait for Dr. Saidatul for her to come in and introduce you. And then so quite a lot of noise okay. in there, okay. Uh, and then we can kick off our webinar, all right? Okay. Uh, let me wait yeah, for sure. the to, to side up. Uh, I'm to, sure. I'm trying to check out in Facebook on the streaming part. Yeah, I try. Yeah, I try to check out on Facebook also. I think there's an ICT people uh, in here, so probably he can check for us. Facebook. Hmm. Okay. Uh, that's technology is so convenient yeah i know i mean yeah <laughs> everything is there yes Eh, ese es All right, can we start everybody? Everyone ready for our presentation today by Daniel Yap? Hi, I'm yeah. ready. All right, everyone. Um, Assalamualaikum and very good afternoon. Um, so today we're going to have our first uh, webinar, our I mean like industry webinar by Dr. Fazira. So our speaker today is Dr. Daniel Yap. Welcome, Dr. Uh, welcome, uh, Daniel Yap. <laughs> Soon to be, All right? Uh, but before we start, uh, let me introduce you to all the um, our participants today. Okay, so uh, here is a little bit introduction for Daniel Yap. Daniel Yap received his Bachelor of Engineering in Electrical and Electronics Engineering 
from University of Technology of Malaysia in 2002 and completed his MBA from University of South Australia in August 2007. He joined Agilent Technologies in 2005 as a material engineer and since then he has held a variety of engineering roles, technical marketing, product supports and business development in the areas of microwave components and network analysis. In April 2016, he has been appointed as Asia Pacific Education Business Development Manager, which focuses on collaborations with universities, researchers, and professors on new research discovery and supporting their high impact research work. This also includes exploring new teaching solutions in engineering studies. By now, he has more than 90 universities and research institute engagements. Daniel has also been appointed as University Industry Advisory Panel for University of Malaysia Perlis and also Curtin University Malaysia. In his spare time, he enjoys a mountain biking, cycling through the various orchid and hills in Penang Island. So, um, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Daniel Yap uh, to present his presentation and the title Quantum Information Technology. Please welcome. Great. Thank you, Saidatu. Thank you for the introduction. Welcome. Um, yeah. A very good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for attending this uh, webinar series. Now, I have to say a disclaimer. First of all, um, I'm not an expert in quantum, but I know a little bit here and there what is really needed. Um, again, the, the real expertise of quantum actually lies in the hand of the physicist. So normally, um, folks from School of Science or School of Physics, they are the one um, that look into this area. And secondly, uh, how does this translate into ECE or electrical and computer engineering student, uh, mainly because a lot of these research activities actually are interrelate with our knowledge as well, because a big portion of the quantum control requires microwave. Okay, so probably um, I'll start um, with a brief introduction about Keysight, who is Keysight? Maybe some of you are still very new, are not familiar with the name. Keysight Technologies. So, well, Keysight Technologies, we, we are here and everywhere in the electronic, wherever the electronic signal goes. Uh, we are in the business of looking into all sorts of, I would say, consumer products or industrial products that, that you see today, like smartphones, tablets. When we talk about uh, autonomous vehicle, we are there as well. We look into how vehicles uh, communicate with each other. All this requires a lot of network protocols and also signal, okay? Uh, and you can see all the list down here, we are showing that uh, we are in the business of clean energy, semiconductor, aerospace and defense, and also general electronics. Okay, so key side, we are at the heart of te technology, at the heart of digital revolutions, meaning to say that uh, if you look to the next, few years, uh, we are playing an active role in it. Uh, as you can see, like IoT, uh, automotive wireless or cloud, okay? So Keysight has a long history. We have more than 80 years of expertise. Probably just want to highlight some of the facts and figures from here. Uh, we have uh, more than 1,700 US and foreign patents issued or still pending. And then 29 of top 30 tech companies uses Keysight. Uh, our last year revenue uh, that we have is about 4.3 billion. And uh, we're also very proud to say that because Keysight, uh, we are taking a lead uh, as a lead in the leadership for 5G definition aspect. So we have more than 12 market ready 5G news, new radio solution available. Um, in fact, uh, most of the, I would say, um, 5G technology that you see that is available in the world today, all are enabled by Keysight, okay? 
Now, this is Kisa at glance. Um, the, uh, the portrait, the picture on the right hand side, this is our CEO. He's based in Santa Rosa, California. That is also where our headquarters uh, lies. Uh, our presence, customer location is more than 100 countries in the world. Okay. And uh, worldwide, we have about 13,000 employees. Uh, just right in Penang. In fact, in Penang, um, we have one large facility. In, we call it as a campus. Uh, we have about 3,000 plus employees. It is the largest campus or largest site in the whole world. And I would say probably 80% of the worldwide product being made in Penang. So we hire a lot of engineers at the same time. Okay. Now, uh, Key side, maybe some of you are still unfamiliar with the name, but a um, few years ago, we were known as Agilent Technologies. For the older generation, maybe 30 years ago, Now I did mention if submit is here at 148, this is about 10,000 uh, gigaflops. So you can see that the, the difference of the speed is tremendous. Okay, uh, of course, you just look at the price. This is the price from Lazada, it's about 4,000 ringgit. So 
So if you want to do that kind of processing power, you need to spend a lot of money and you need to build a lot of CPU as well. So that will give you some idea of how much power as a supercomputer. Okay, now let's dive a little bit deeper inside. As we all know, a classical computer, you run on a binary. That's a one and zero, right? Now, in a QC, a quantum computer, we call it QC, they, the, the bits are known as qubits. So it can represent as one or zero, or the third step we know as a superposition step. It can be a one or zero, it means something in between. So what is really beautiful about quantum computer, this qubit is, uh, you have one additional step, you can actually have more information being stored or being carried. So if you have three qubits uh, to the power of three, directly you have add stats. And you can imagine that you keep on multiplying that, uh, increasing it, you have even more uh, stats. Um, so three of the major qubits, now, Okay, let's talk about theory, right? So three of the major qubits that's very common in the world today, researchers are working on, is based on semiconductor. That is, first of all, is Jessupin Junction. Uh, the other one is Q dot or quantum dot. And the third one is trap iron. So I have seen all these three uh, type of qubits being implemented just in Asia Pacific alone. Okay, it is very interesting. Uh, what is really uh, mind uh, boggling is uh, the amount of uh, accuracy or computation or instrument that being used just to control the qubit of one qubit. Now, uh, for about four years ago, when I visited uh, one of the research lab in Japan, uh, just to do one qubit in a classic, I mean, in a traditional way, not the modern way of how Keysight we are doing, uh, we are actually trying to help the researcher uh, if you want to set up one superconducting qubit, that is Jessupin just just Junction, you need about between 6 million to 10 million US dollar. That's a lot of money, right? 6 to 10 million US dollars just for one qubit. So you say, oh, I'm going to design, I'm going to build a 100 qubit. You really, really need a lot of money. So far, we have seen in most universities in, or research uh, institutes in Asia Pacific, uh, I think a lot of them are already, they've already got two qubits and uh, they are moving to the higher qubit stats, um, five to 10 in the next few years. Okay. Mm, so how fast is super con uh, super uh, this quantum computer? If we compare to the super con uh, uh, the supercomputer, it is about 3,600 times faster than the supercomputer. Right. It is so fast. Right. That is the reason why um, I would say that uh, you think that quantum computer will replace the traditional computer. No, it will not. In fact, quantum computer will just be used as a very specific um, application focus kind of uh, calculation. So, such example, crypto analysis, uh, you might do a weather prediction polymer simulation, even like drug, you know that we have this COVID-19, right? So drug also is, I mean, you want to do simulation to understand how does this certain drugs function against uh, the viruses. You also require some sort of computational power to do the calculation. Um, I did a Google check that uh, typical like for polymer, you may do a computer simulation from nanosecond or femtosecond to even days. So the amount of processing power is varies, depends on the type of thing that we are looking at. So who is investing right now today? Uh, Google, yes. Google today, they got 53 qubits. IBM, they got uh, 32 qubits. In fact, they are actually looking into doubling this number of qubits every year. Cost Microsoft as well. Okay. Um, quantum research challenges, there's a lot actually, but I will say these are the few, the top three. First of all, it's a material to create the qubits. These qubits, it can be a natural, can be artificial, can be just an electron. Uh, 
uh, that's moving around. The second challenge is uh, to how, how to control this qubit step. I will explain later on in the later slides. So to control the coherence time means the qubit at a very stable step. Like if I take this mouse and show it, I want to make it stable for this electron. I need, because they are very prone to noise, environmental noise, RF noise, it get destroyed easily. So it's so important that the, the reader has enough time or fast enough to read what is the state of the qubit. And thirdly, scalability of the qubit. Remember, I just mentioned you need about six to 10 million US dollar just to set up one qubit. What if you are going to build 10? And then uh, not only money involved, you, you need a huge space, very, very big space uh, just to set up the, just to set up the, uh, what is that? The qubit or the quantum computer. I, was, I have some pictures I can show it to you. So um, let's look at the image diagram on the bottom right here. So imagine that this is the electron. We uh, typically, we look into the electron, whether we can induce uh, RF signal, you can, we call it the excited state or the ground state. Not only that, the microwave um, actually use this to read the, the, the state of the qubit. Now, every of these microwave signals or even pulses, they will affect the position or the angle of the qubit state. So you can see, um, I have one qubit here, this block sphere. It can be in any angle, any position to represent a step. So some of you say, okay, that is very strange. So how are we going to read it? So researchers typically is, you know, in binary computer, we can tell uh, definitely or confidently that this is a one, this is a zero. But in quantum computer, that's not the case. It's a lot on probability, it's more like statistics. You, you may want to run 10,000 times or 100,000 times or the similar instruction, similar signal, the same signal, just to get a, uh, to verify, oh, this qubit right now is in an excited state or in a ground state or even in the superposition state. Okay, some, some, some additional information. I'm not going to read all this, but maybe this slide I'll share with uh, Fazira later on. So remember, I did mention about the three qubit side Jessefen junction. There's actually uh, a two semiconductor uh, weakly link uh, with the insulator to get to split the electron flow in, in both directions at the same time. This is very popular, but it's also one of the most expensive implementation. And the coherence time, the time of the, the electron is also maybe it's not very long, so it's very strong. The other one is been known as a quantum dot. So this is very much on a nanostructure, a dot in a nanostructure. It can be anything, can be a silicon or so on as well. The third one, iron trap. Iron trap is very different from the first two uh, because the first two are based on semiconductor technique. The third one is a lot more on the phot photonics area means that they use optical to excite the atom and just to read, charge up the particles and to get the information. So uh, iron trap in terms of cost of implementation, it will be much cheaper. Okay, another three important terms, I think I did explain earlier on, what is a qubit? Qubit is a way of how we interpret information for quantum. The other term is superposition, I also explained. It is the step when the qubit exists in the third step, uh, st third step in between one and zero or between excited and ground step. And the other one is very important term uh, if you move, if you study in quantum is entanglement. Okay, so entanglement is actually a quantum mechanical phenomenon where uh, you have two qubits that none of them are seeing each other, but either one of them knows what is happening at the other side, right? 
Again, uh, I will say two qubit, they don't know each other, they can't see, you don't send signal, but if this changes, this will change at the same time without any uh, any external force. Because in quantum qubits, the moment one of the challenges is the, mom the moment you try, let's say this is a qubit this mouse, the moment you try to read it, the quantum destroy. Right? The moment you touch it, the quantum destroy. So that's the biggest challenge. But how they how they do it, um, there's a way to do the readout. That's why they have to run the try to understand, guess, oh, what are you? Are you in an excited state or are you in a ground state? Okay, just remember this free term for the time being. So what are qubit used for? Well, uh, quantum computing, that's the first one. Uh, it uses quantum mechanical phenomena such as superposition and entanglement to perform computation. Uh, quantum computer um, uses qubits for, of course, like qubits computational. So you can see that these are all the typical, like very specific uh, application. Second, uh, for quantum communication, uh, well, it takes advantage on the law, the behavior of quantum physics to protect data. Remember, I did say that the moment you try to touch a qubit, it destroys. And you cannot copy or you cannot clone the information in a qubit. The most you can do, you can transfer the data. You, there will be never in a single step to information. Uh, I mean, that data you can duplicate. Never, it will not happen. Uh, they call it the, the quantum decloning theorem something that I read as well. And whoever interested can Google more on that. And third one, quantum sensing. Again, it uses the natural behavior of the quantum properties to do measurement, to, um, to do sensing. Well, some, I did hear that some companies, they start to use quantum for quantum sensors, uh, for building architecture because uh, of the high position it is. All right. Okay, next slide. Now, who has a quantum computer today? Well, I, I'm going to break this into two areas, two big group. One is quantum annealing. Okay, this actually is pioneered by D-Wave, a company based in Canada. So you can see that it is a local computing. They, the quantum technology is based on superconducting qubits. That is the Jessefen junction. Super is, again, of course, the word, when you hear the word superconducting, means that it is operating at extreme cold temperature. And then they do have system for sale right now. If you know, uh, you, maybe Unimap is interested to evaluate, or maybe you can buy on Huawei. However, uh, quantum annealing, it has. Uh, it doesn't solve all sorts of problems. It only solves limited type of problems. It is based on optimized technique to determine the minimal and the maximum function of, of a given set of candidates. It means that it is a condition. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that I throw these problems, these questions, it's solved uh, very beautifully or very fast. It is based on specific set of instruction for certain condition. Of course, uh, it has uh, the beauty of it. The other one is a gate based or semiconductor. Uh, players are like IBM Q, Rigetti, uh, of course, Amazon uh, Web Services, AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure. So they are looking into this system to put up in the cloud. It's cloud based computer, quantum computing. And in terms of qubit implementation, few types, two types. Either it's a Superconducting qubits or Q dots can be a Q dots as well, or even like trap ions. And of course, um, they do have some free, or you want, if you want to use, you have to pay for it. I think, uh, I think IBM, you, IBM do have uh, some sort of uh, free, you can use it for evaluation. And in terms of hardware, they build their own hardware and they also partner with someone else to do that. So, Below here, there's a term, so don't be fooled. 
the technology is still a nascent phase, means that you think that this is ready or matured. No, they are still at the very beginning where uh, in terms of commercial, that's why you see that these commercial companies, they start to see the potential over the recent years. And But in order to get today, what you see today, it has been done many, many, uh, many years of research work to go. Okay. Uh, everyone's still with me. Yeah. <laughs> We're still with you, Mr. Daniel. All right, good. Thank you. <laughs> please, please, uh, I, I don't, I try my best to explain the, the most easiest way. Huh? Okay, okay. All right, good. So uh, remember I say uh, the price. So you need a, you need a fridge. Uh, you need a petit surgeon, huh? you need a fridge, or actually we call it the cryogenic um, system. Okay, look at the, you look at this image on the left side here, this white color uh, tub or whatever, white color cover, that is the fridge or the refrigerator. It is supposed to bring down the temperature to a very cool state, almost at zero Kelvin. Okay, you, so a superconducting qubit requires such temperature to do that. Now, if I look into this picture carefully, I only see one fridge. Means uh, they are working on one qubit only. Uh, one qubit. So you can imagine if two qubit, you need to duplicate these two. So see how big is it? It's, it's huge, you know. So if this is, let's say, at least six million US dollar, just a fridge, yeah? the fridge is six million US dollar. You need to factor, you haven't factored in what is the price of the electronics instruments over here, the cables, the wiring, everything. So it's a lot of money. Okay, really, really a lot of money. So if I open up this white cover, this is what I'm going to see inside. You can see the layers, first layer, second layer, third layer, fourth layer. At the bottom here will be the qubit. So each layer of this uh, fridge, actually it brings down the temperature. And you, you, I think you also can observe that there's cables running through different stages of it. So I, I would say that if you are in the, I mean, if you are, if you are planning to work on some sort of research uh, in the future, in the future, maybe this could be a one interesting research topic for you all because the, the, I think there's no, uh, what, what we have right now is not an off-shelf uh, solution, it's still based on what researcher feels is, is the best and they do a lot of this uh, based on homebrew technique. Okay, so uh, there, there you go, I did mention about the interconnects. So you can see there's hundreds of interconnect in it, really, really a lot. Uh, it is so, uh, so fragile and High precision required. You need a very good material uh, to transfer the signal because uh, noise, uh, signal to noise, uh, you want to keep the signal to noise ratio very well. And uh, over here, this is a qubit, right? The processor. And this is another one. This is uh, a silicon qubit for high frequency. This is done by UNSW. Okay. Well, well, this is a DWF technology. Okay, the quantum computer with superconducting qubit. So let's look at the first one here. I want to show, show you. So just now I did mention the processor is down there under the hood. So the processor is actually located here. And then um, this, this actually, this whole part is also very expensive already. It is, how cold is it? Um, it's colder than outer space. Very cold. It's 10 millikelvin. 10 millikelvin, I mean, a few more Kelvin, it will be a zero Kelvin. It's, it's super, super cold, okay? And then the second stage, uh, the upper tier, they are various stages, okay? But on, on this top level, uh, the outer space is, let's say it's a three Kelvin. So you can see that the type of corners required to, to freeze, I would say to freeze the qubit is so critical just to make sure that that electron doesn't move. Okay, so that we have uh, enough uh, coherent time uh, 
uh, to do the reading. Okay. And then next is uh, liquid nitrogen temperature on top here, this side. And then our room temperature, 300 Kelvin on top here. Right. So what happened is, what really happened is informations are being transferred all the way down and go up back just to get the uh, data, how you look at it. So microwave pulses of certain frequency, again, uh, microwave pulses of certain frequency, that's the reason why I think this is where our knowledge coming from uh, ECE, electrical and computer engineering applies. Uh, you need to have this kind of uh, knowledge, how to control it. You know, as a physicist, they, they know very well on this area, but it is an interdiscipline uh, effort to build that. Okay. So at the end of the uh, pulses, we get the uh, output of the data, so calculation, we get the stat out. This is how it goes. So uh, before I go to these slides, uh, I mean this image I spent. So again, this is just a fridge. So outside here, remember the earlier image, they are like signal generators located outside on the fridge uh, that send signals all the time, uh, 10,000 or 20,000 times very fast. Uh, the readout signals, all these signals being read out, uh, they will be being, being amplified. Uh, to carry out for digital analysis. Yeah, this data will be digitized. Okay. Each qubit, each qubit are being controlled, uh, connected for different control lines for readout. So again, uh, there'll be hundreds of cable carrying signal back and forth between room temperature in equipment and the really cool quantum chip. Okay, now another type of qubit. Earlier on, I was talking about superconducting qubit. Remember here, this word? Now, another type of quantum computer uh, that's uh, trapped ion qubits. So this is based on optical. So you can combine both optical and RF pulses together. And you have to bring a line really, uh, really, really uh, precise to get the uh, information being translated to being modulated. I think the answer is, I mean, the word is modulated both RA signal and optical signal. So this is how it works, okay? So what do customers care about? In this word, I mean, it is what we say, or researcher cares about. I mean, there is, there's plenty of things to consider here. It's just not about talking about cable or computational. Um, first of all, you look at it, even like, each section, they have different challenges. When you go at a room temperature control, you have this stability, you've got synchronization, you've got scalability, you've got cost per channel. You want to bring the cost at the end of the day. And then if you go to the lower temperature component, there are different sets of uh, requirements at the same time. The specification must be there, your performance, again, cost again. And finally, at the processor, the qubit side, the lifetime of qubit means the coherence time of qubit. Um, the best is as long as possible because too short before you even send a signal to read the pulses, you might miss it. Okay, error. Okay, error is another big uh, challenges for researchers today. Uh, what means saying that uh, Q Q is a quantum error correction, uh, meaning to say, remember I didn't mention about ten thousand times. You don't send one signal just to get an answer. You might want to send ten thousand times to get a certain. A, a certain answer, a confident answer. So every time you send a signal, you get one uh, feedback outside, uh, out, read out, of course, and then you, you compare, you keep comparing the, the rest of it. And today, uh, key side, we actually help researchers by deploying FPGA because FPGA has a function to do uh, feedback control. So what is the pulses? What is the next pulses? I need to control why is the amplitude. So we keep on sending that until we get the answer that is stable. So how do we actually view the signal? Actually, it's very simple. You just view it from a scope. So if you want to view a sine wave, the first dot, you run 10,000 times. Then second dot, you slowly plot into it. Okay. Uh, connectivity and crosstalks. So uh, qubits have very short 
uh, usable lifetime, they are very sensitive to noise, and, as I mentioned. Uh, the equipment that used have to be very good in uh, signal to noise ratio. Uh, it must be very good in phase noise and low latency, very fast. How fast uh, we are talking about nanoseconds, like under maybe under 200 nanoseconds, uh, it's very, very fast. So we do have instruments uh, with that kind of capability. Okay, so maybe let's look into superconducting qubit. How does it uh, really function? So a super a superconducting qubit uh, can be considered like a modified. You look at this like a modified LC oscillator. The resonant frequency a few gigahertz. Uh, right, it is coupled to a readout. Okay, so it is coupled to a readout and the control lines uh, to set or reset it. So you you do that and then the qubits is located at the bottom of the fridge so next uh next slide so what we get next uh, is some equipment generated to control the microwave pulses so on top here typically they might use the network analyzer that's very common to generate the pulses or even like a awg activity waveform generator to send a signal the pulses and to do the readout. So, of course, once you send a signal, we need to do something to decode the readout pulses to know the QB set. Uh, with that, uh, you need to send the signal out again. Okay. So the control, the control and the readout pulses have a frequency between three to ten gigahertz and a few nanosecond to a hundred nanosecond uh, of speed. Okay. So next, I'm going bigger, eh? explode slowly, explode out. Okay, so you look at the red box there. Now, this is where key sites uh, solution plays in this red box. So there are two ways, two different ways to generate microwave pulses, like I mentioned. We could use a direct microwave output uh, from a high-speed AWG, or we could also use a baseband AWG and use the IQ, the IQ signal, uh, to modulate the up up convert signal okay both approach are being used uh, in general so maybe it might be very convenient to use a direct microwave you know you just send a signal in dealing with a few qubits but again remember you can do that with a few qubits maybe three four qubits but as a scale as you go up like five to ten you need more instruments and you need to spend more money you need more space just to put your fridge and your control system. So as the number of qubits increases, uh, so does the cost and complexity of synchronization. You have a lot of uh, challenges to, you know, all the cables coming in and out. You need to synchronize uh, hundreds. I think it's really a lot. I've seen before, like, it looks like, uh, you know, Octopus or Hamdi has uh, tentacles. I think it's more than that. Okay. Uh, so Keysight, we do help researchers by offering a uh, cost-effective approach uh, using PXI base. So PXI base means that uh, maybe some of you might be using a network analyzer, right? It's a dedicated benchtop. But PXI base is, is a modular form with dedicated card slot. You could fit in maybe one chassis. You could fit in up to 50 pops or maybe like here we say 10 slots of cards to do the same thing. So this will bring down the cost because at the end of the day, you just you don't need to use the full function features of the network analyzer, but you just need to generate a signal out. There's also AWG or digitizers being used for that. So we want to help uh, researchers, you know, the solution to be scalable, multi-channel sync, uh, one qubit talking to it, the next qubit, the next qubit, and the next qubit all sync together. Uh, with the error correction control, QEC, so and so on. And then at the same time, low latency. I think, uh, if, I hope maybe some of you in the, have the opportunity in the future. Uh, I mean, if you like this field, you know, you, you're able to see that how does software plays a uh, critical role in controlling all these synchronizations. It's, it's really amazing. Now, I thought of maybe sharing you some some of these uh, researchers are currently working. Uh, one of them is maybe you can look at uh, Andrew Zurek. 
She is from uh, University of New South Wales in uh, Sydney. Uh, they are actually working on this uh, spin qubit. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, idea, and we, in, in fact, uh, I have visited them, several groups of them. So the other, his colleague that you want to check out as well is uh, Andrea Morello. Andrea Morello, um, he is um, working on this theory. I mean, they are pushing for it. Uh, Sydney government also looking into this area as something, uh, something very important for their whole education ecosystem. Another one is uh, quantum teleportation or a quantum repeater. This is the behind stage after you build a quantum computer. Uh, one day, of course, you need to send your signal, right? You need to transport your signal. It's not just confined to this small area. You maybe it's from say from Unimap, you need to send your signal to Cyberjaya or maybe to Japan or some around the world or even to the satellite. You need to have some sort of quantum teleportation technique or quantum repeat. So um, I also met with uh, Kosaka, Professor Kosaka. He's uh, he's working on it and it's very interesting. And he was using a diamond, uh, a real diamond. Uh, Probably was yeah, I think it was a real diamond or maybe an artificial diamond, I couldn't remember. And to to understand to see how this quantum uh, information being transported. Yeah, very interesting concept. Okay. Um, um, if you check in the website, the internet, there are many quantum researchers are working on. I just thought of showing these are all uh, internet available information you can check out. Uh, some from Raiken in Japan or UNSW again. Okay. okay, so far, any questions? Are we doing okay here? Right. Well, uh, Daniel, I got a questions, um, but in the yeah. chat box, but you can yeah. continue, then we can uh, continue after that. Okay, sure. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, yeah. Okay, let's get back to class. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, give me a second. I had to drink water. Yeah, hey, sure, sure. Take your time. Don't worry. <clears throat> now, so quantum engineering solution. So it is right now everywhere to the electronic signal. Wherever the electronic signal goes, of course, we have said Kisa is there. The the main driver today, we see that quantum is actually uh, being invested a lot in um, cloud companies. You can think who are the cloud companies and also the, of course, the government area, government as well. Now, let's look into the high level. Uh, the, the intent of sharing this slide uh, onwards is, I think I want to open up the ideas. Hey, if I'm interested to do quantum research, how do I begin or what are the opportunities available? I have to say that the opportunity is a lot, uh, many areas. Um, maybe one day uh, yeah, there's opportunity uh, for Unimed to look into this. So let's look into like quantum computing uh, on the application layer. You have a computing, you have a communication and you have the sensing. And then if you go one level down, the most of the systems or the components or the technology elements are pretty much the same. Okay, so you need you need to have this dedicated system. In fact, today in the market, nobody has this uh, sell off the shelf. Means you cannot go to Amazon or Lazada and buy or Taobao and buy. It's very uh, niche area. And from there, as a researcher, PhD student, or post post grad, you want to look into specific area where this opportunity being available. You have someone who is working on the design. Once you design, let's say, a semiconductor of the Jefferson Junction, what type of material you want to use. Then after that, you do a prototyping. You may want to have, a, maybe you build your own semiconductor in a clean room. After that, you do a design validation. From design validation, if you have good result, then you talk about, oh, if it has good result, then you can go for Manufacturing test, large scale, maybe on a wafer level. And then at the end of the day, you do a packaging, final product. And of course, there's also a need in 
uh, maintenance and repair. So what we are trying to say is uh, all these are involved. Key sites are actively uh, engaging in this all in this whole area, right? from design, test, and control. Now, now let's look into this quantum area in specific. Uh, I'll say in diagram, what are the specific hardware or software or even like system requires? Now, if you are we now we know that we can actually split the qubits into two groups. Either you go with a cryogenic system with the fridge or the non cryogenic system using the trap iron. Yeah, that's more on the optical side. And both of these systems somehow you need to uh, have all these fundamental uh, solution that uh, just now I didn't mention about the PXI, right? So you want to have all this, uh, you want to be scalable, you want to bring the cost down. So we are helping researchers that, oh, instead of spending so much money in buying boxes, you can actually do it in a modular best. And then you've got a software with the FPGA. Uh, we also have the very high bandwidth solution like AWG. And of course, the interconnect solutions. Now, on the cryogenic quantum system from design to test, um, these are the area of um, activities being done. Let's look at, for the first one, let's look at the control system. Even you want to build a control system, it's not that one person does everything. It is almost like a group of people doing one thing. Like if you want to design on the control system, maybe you have to start from software and then you go through everything as well. Same thing as a qubit on the right hand side. If you look into the, the flow of the work activity, it's almost the same, see? Design, design verification, validation, and manufacturing. What I'm trying to say here is a key point is a key side. We, again, uh, we do support research in this area. Uh, across, we have the complete uh, catalog on that area. So maybe one day, if you're working on, let's say, cryogenic electronics, superconducting components. These are the same thing that for you to look into the area of uh, development. Okay. Now, if you, let's say, you might say, hey, Daniel, uh, cryogenic system is very expensive. I don't think our UC may spend the money immediately in this area. Okay. You have another uh, area that to consider. Maybe you go to a non-cryogenic system because remember I said the I just mentioned the fridge can be expensive at like six million US dollar. So you might want to start with optical. Maybe some of you are very uh, the experts in optical uh, area. This is where the uh, you may want to uh, utilize uh, use your expertise for the development. Same thing like the cryogenic system. You also have to go through the same process at the end of the day. Okay. Mm. Next slide. Okay, these are just uh, some sort of, uh, I just want to show the broad solution that we have. Um, now this, this is the PXI module that I mentioned. You can actually put in everything. Um, this is scope. So on in all, what I'm trying to, to pass the message is, uh, key sites are act actively engaged in this. We have the complete solutions to support. Okay. Okay, let's move to a classical approach example. So I closed that chapter. I just want to open a new chapter right now. Now remember I did mention a classical way that earlier on before you have the PXI base. Okay, so in the classical approach, traditional approach for about four years ago before there's really a PXI base, uh, researchers typically this is what they do. Uh, to do like a few qubits or in this case, six qubits, you need uh, you need a number of boxes or instruments you have to stack up or you want to arrange it. So look at the number of signal generators you have to invest. I think maybe, I don't know how much it is, but I know it's uh, may cost maybe like 100, 100K US dollar. So you have to like spend a lot and then you will also take up a lot of space in your lab. Okay, this is a very traditional. Of course, in the olden days, during the research activity, it was still early. 
researchers are looking into the single qubit development, two qubits development. It is still considered affordable <laughs> in a quantum quantum term, uh, quantum spending. But again, if you go to five qubits and ten qubits, it's not. First of all, it's not scalable. It's not cost effective. And then you have all these instruments that you need to trigger. You have to set the triggering manually. There's no such thing as quantum error correction feedback using uh, FPGA. So you know, it's just like tuning tuning a guitar or tuning a piano. You have to have someone to train and then listen. Oh, this one high pitch, lower down a little bit, slowly, slowly. So you have to trigger like it's an art, okay? So you have to do that. Now with uh, of course. Uh, I'll skip this because I did mention earlier on. So with, with that, today uh, we're actually helping researchers to move all this thing into a scalable technique, meaning, that, meaning to say everything is in this box right now, this kind of size. So this can support uh, really a lot of qubits development and you have a uh, real-time feedback, hard real-time with we are seeing hard real time. We also allow custom FPGA programming. And uh, of course, there are software being, uh, being used to do this uh, synchronization automatically. I think that's really beautiful. Yeah. Okay. So, a fully integrated scalable solution. If I took just now the earlier diagram, we can right now replace it with two things, uh, the control software and the PXI chassis. Okay, if I go back to the left side just now, this thing here, all right, it's now you just down to two, down to PXI chassis and the software. So that is really, really something that technology is advancing. Our key side, we continue to invest in this area uh, because we believe that uh, this is, uh, there's a lot of potential in uh, in it. So uh, the next image here, it shows that, well, there you go. How many, how many signal generators you need? Let's say here 10. And then this is uh, uh, AWG. And then this is uh, another signal generator. You can replace just like that. Right? So of course, you save a lot of money. Right, space. So this is five qubit example. How to solve all this? I did into this. Okay. I did mention about software. Again, uh, the software here, I, I would say if you are using C or LabVIEW or MATLAB, all this uh, is very useful because these are same tools. Uh, you think Python is like gaining momentum. Python seems like to be a new kind of uh, software language that's being welcomed by the quantum community. And then uh, in Keysight itself, we have designed a, a hardware virtual uh, interface or instrument design environment. What is, what is really interesting about this one through this hardware programming means, you know, if you look at here at the bottom left, these individual cards, with these cards, when I slot into the chassis, if I change a time here, maybe at, let's say I change 10 nanoseconds, it will automatically uh, synchronize the rest of the cards just to make sure that they are synchronized together. So that is really, really amazing. And finally, is the FPGA programming. Uh, we have also graphical interface on that. Okay. Now, uh, so you again, the next question you might ask. So uh, Daniel, uh, are you working with any uh, quantum lab currently in the world? Yes, we do. I mean, uh, the one that we really um, work a lot is uh, we, has, we are building a multi-year partnership with MIT uh, and Professor Will Oliver, uh, William Oliver. So you can see that this is his lab and all these instruments are required. So you could imagine the amount of these research activities are required to do that. So it's 
very interesting. Okay, and uh, this is his uh, his lab, uh, Professor Will Oliver lab, and we do partnership with labor as well. The good news is, uh, just early this year, before our MCO, we bought we bought this company, labor. So we were actually uh, as a partner with labor. And then we see there's a potential key side decided to uh, acquire labor and uh, set up as a um, part of the key side ecosystem and resides in MIT. So we are actually uh, hiring quantum engineers uh, in MIT as well to continue to the, the development of this area. So it's very interesting. I'm very excited to see uh, how we move from here. And I would say uh, there's so much potential in it. All this information you can read from the internet as well. Uh, it's nothing confidential. Okay. Now, uh, as I actually visited a lot of universities and also um, research institutes, I continue to learn and observe that uh, the quantum activities are the what would I say the interest in quantum research, not just in quantum computing, are uh, picking up pretty well. Uh, the amount of research topic that we can see that's popping up here and there is also getting more and more. Like example, you if you are working on material, and then if you go more advanced nano material, there are research uh, looking at quantum nano material measurement. And then if you are looking working on terahertz, there are also research in quantum terahertz in solid state devices. There will be a quantum microwave, um, quantum sensor or quantum magnetometry, quantum internet. This is also picking up lately, very interesting. How does quantum internet works? Uh, it's almost like edge computing. So edge computing is some sort of like machine learning with AI. And with quantum internet, this is can be applied so your computational work can be done very fast locally in the network on uh, the cloud area. Quantum repeater, I did mention just now. Uh, right now, you want to transmit your data, you want to repeat your quantum data. Quantum silicon photonics, also a lot, uh, very interesting. Um, I would say in Malaysia, um, probably only two universities in Malaysia are, do, do have quantum, but they, are, they do not have quantum laboratory, or what I say, quantum experimental lab is still very much on theory based um, yeah again uh, probably this is um, something maybe Malaysia government might want to see in the future uh, let's see quantum antenna or quantum radar very interesting topic as well um, when you think about quantum antenna oh what is this oh, quantum radar who is using this uh, they are actually, you can check out this, this, this as well. It is a very, um, I would say very advanced uh, kind of uh, thinking. Quantum cable, remember the interconnects, how you want to, if your qubits, uh, if, if you have one qubit, you've got so many cables, so if you've got 100 qubits, how are you going to address these challenges? And then you have to talk about cross talks. You have to think about uh, losses of information at microwave. And then noise, how are you going to overcome this noise from the environment? Quantum semiconductor and finally it's quantum artificial intelligence. You know what? Um, I say maybe in the future, there'll be a quantum courseway, a quantum program for maybe undergraduate or master students. Okay. Okay, um, third section of the slide, I think this is Oh, I'm already more than one hour, right? Okay. I guarantee you this is another 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. So, um, when we look into this area, after I discuss and share all these things, um, you, maybe some of you may thought, oh, this is, how do I get involved? Actually, uh, it's still very much actually coming from the ECE school as well, the School of Computer uh, electrical and computer engineering because uh, like what you saw just now, all these things is very microwave based, okay? There's so many like you need to control pulses, you talk about interconnects, this and that, and then you, 
even that you look at here, quantum terahertz, quantum internet, all these are all communication related. There is a lot of activities that require talent from ECE side. Okay, one of the area that we are actually also trying to help physicists to look into it because, uh, you know, physicists, their background are physics. So we also trying to help physicists to say, oh, to, to get you get up to speed, uh, these are, uh, I mean, we can help you in this area using our courseware that we develop uh, that really go through in detail. Like you need a low noise amplifier in your design. Why it's so critical, why it's so important. Uh, in fact, uh, microwave is will be here to stay forever, I would say. Uh, regardless in in any technology, even you talk about IoT, you still need to know about microwave or RF. And this this course there that Keysight developed is we bring we help the students uh, to understand what is really required from the industry's point of view. If you want to design something, these are the key area that they have to go through. So like Keysight, when we hire uh, fresh graduates, we also um, very careful, but because we want to hire the best talent at the same time, we look certain skills that what they have obtained from universities. So if the student, has, in fact, based on the final year project or based on the paper they written in the journal, we we'll see that, oh, you do some sort of simulation, uh, you understand the spec, and then you do some sort of prototype. At the end of the day, you do, once you finish your prototype, you compare your prototype with an industry grade component, see how good is your design. So we are bringing the same thought uh, in this area as well. Now, if you, let me show you here. Now, this, this is a concept for RF microwave. I know a lot of uh, universities and maybe even like Unimed, you all have already have your own RF program or RF cosplay uh, that go through a fundamental. So they are actually, don't be surprised, they are also universities, uh, it's very theory based. They do not have, uh, I mean, opportunity to, I mean, it's not a focus, but I would say it depends on university. Uh, they do not have, a, at least they got a software simulation, but there's no hardware, uh, hands-on learning. So Keysight, we actually bring this down like, oh, we will let one, I'm going to learn about transmission line. And then this is a transmission line. This is based on the real data. If you look at the key component, uh, we actually partnership with a company called uh, X Microwave, but uh, what is really interesting is these are the real component. It allows for fast prototyping. You can compare a similar re simulation result uh, with these industry components. And then lab two, you talk about filter. Lab three, you go to a low noise amplifier and so on. At the end of the day, when the student complete the lab activities indirectly, they actually learn to build a 5G new radio receiver. Huh? Indirectly, this is a receiver for 5G. Uh, of course, here we are talking about sub six gigahertz kind of uh, 5G new radio receiver. So all in all, we want the student <coughs> to go through uh, both the hardware and software. Like they go through the at least these are the software. I mean ADS, and then hands-on measurement. How do I really understand that uh, this student requires to? I mean these students are fit because if you. I will say that to hire a good RF engineer today is not easy. Uh, it takes a while. Mm, the, the other thing is because as company, in fact, let's look at a real situation today, COVID-19. Uh, what happened of this? Out of this situation, COVID-19, more and more companies are pushing for IoT-based or internet-based kind of solutions. So if you look into IoT, a lot of IoT things are wireless or RF related. So even like, you may wear a tracking monitor, right? In fact, I know your Unimac, you have this GPS tracker. It's also a very IoT based. It's still about wireless. How are you going to use this signal to as an application? So we are looking for skilled student uh, in that area. Now, so once this student uh, actually complete, we also recognize this we also offer a program. We call it the Keysight University Students Certification Program. Uh, this program actually is to recognize the student competency in RF, where uh, Keysight will actually award a certificate, a real certificate, hard copy. And of course, we actually uh, promote your university name 
uh, as well in our website. The beauty part of this program is because it is internationally recognized, first of all. Second, uh, the industry recognizes this as well because a lot of this industry, our own customer, they are using the same tool. So if your student or you are using the same tool, the industry feel that, oh, um, to hire you, to get you on job, will be instead of six months, maybe you can catch up within two months and get up to speed on the work. Uh, number three, it's also very powerful to say that uh, if we recognize a student who being nominated, of course, the professor or the department head will nominate, nominate the best student to get this certificate. And we will say that, hey, if your student get this certificate, they are as good or as competent as any of these other students graduated around the world with the same certificate. Because key side, we take a very strict control uh, evaluate, access the program. Then once we access the program, we say, oh, you are good and you can onboard, right? So a lot of them from US, uh, they are from Malaysia, okay? Yeah, Unimap is one of them. Uh, there's also from Korea, Postec, uh, some from uh, UK, like Manchester, some from Germany, Stuttgart, some from Russia as well. So it is an international program and it's very uh, useful award-winning program. Of course, uh, this is a sample certificate I'm going to show you, okay? Level one and level two for RF. So with this, I would say, if you, it brings a strong statement credential. Uh, if you want to, I mean, let's say your student go work for a quantum company in the future. In fact, not only quantum, we can talk about autonomous vehicle. Autonomous vehicle, we talk about automotive radar, you need to some sort of radar design or antenna design. You have this kind of, if there's some sort of assurance, okay, uh, maybe 5G, 6G, right? Now, uh, of course, okay, I just want to show you some of the certificate that we have awarded to Unimap students. We just recently, uh, we just award uh, four students. Uh, these, these students are coming from FTK, Unimap FTK. Uh, of course, I, I heard uh, from Dr. Azrimi, there are some candidates from SCCE right now. Uh, I'm actually very happy to hear that. I'm looking forward to uh, see uh, the names being submitted. And after that, uh, we also publish your name here uh, in our website. It is a very powerful statement to endorse the students saying that uh, these are the good students. And we also promote uh, students to other industries, our customers. You want to hire the best talent, there is where to go. Um, yeah. Okay. And next, um, just some information, just in case um, maybe some of you do not know uh, that Keysight, we have university program that we provide educational discount up to 50%. 15% uh, for the hardware and 50% for the software. So this is one way that uh, we want to help university uh, to support the academia in education sites. So my role in education sites, I really want to support uh, to see the successes. And of course, I hope uh, Malaysia can be very successful in uh, research activities as well. Okay, um, okay. I'll go next. Okay, so uh, the other thing is if you think that you, you really like the content that I shared and you want to try to learn more what else Keysight offer, uh, do check out from our website. We have a very dedicated uh, page just for education only. Uh, we have a lot of app notes. I, I have to say that Keysight produce a lot of uh, white papers, application notes. We have YouTube videos to help you to get up to speed to understand the technology. You want to understand what is cybersecurity or 5G, 6G, uh, everything is uh, available both in our Keysight website and also in the YouTube. Uh, finally, this is something very local, just for Malaysia. Uh, of course, in Malaysia, we do have partners. Uh, maybe some of you may have heard about TechMark. So we do have a partner that support our education and customers locally as well. Of course, you might say, hey, I'm Daniel. I'm not, I can't be all the time supporting everybody. So we actually depends on local partners, uh, their expertise. Uh, to serve uh, to serve you all. 
So I'll share this info on this slide as well. So you can maybe if you want to or you have interest in certain things, maybe you can contact them, right? And okay. Almost towards the end, the last three slides, I hope. So this is a bird eye view of Keysight Technology Malaysia campus. So now this is by the past, right? So right here is the Pulau Jiraja, is a highway. So Keysight is from this end to this end to the car park. If I walk from one end to one end, it's about, maybe I, I was told about one kilometer. <laughs> it's quite long. <laughs> So I, I, I knew that I did before. I walked from here to here. It took me about, about 15 minutes. Okay. So our neighbor here, Broadcom, uh, we have Agilent here. Opposite here is Intel. Uh, of course, Jabil. Okay. This is an elevated highway. So we are located here in the environment pass free industrial zone. Uh, we also hire, we also take in interns. We do have internship programs. Uh, some of you, if you are still students or you want to do your internship, these are the information. Uh, it's available all year long. Minimum must be 12 weeks. Okay, it must be 12 weeks. Uh, 10 weeks is still not good enough. Ideally, uh, the longer the better. Uh, we do pay some money. Uh, we do give money allowance, about 1,200 1, ringgit per month. There will be a cafeteria subsidy, 2 ringgit per day. We have in-house medical coverage. So um, it is very interesting. There's an opportunity to explore, to learn uh, from the experts within Keysight Campus. Uh, and there's a lot of, um, I'll say, different technology as well. Okay. Um, this slide, so if you are interested to get look for a job instead of doing internship, uh, please uh, submit your CV, your resume to recommend at keysight.com or you can learn more about jobs at Keysight, or even follow the Facebook page. Sometimes our HR will post uh, some news in, in the Facebook page as well. Okay, that's it, Fazira. Uh, that's all. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I hope you can hear me clearly from here. Yeah. Is it okay? All right. Yes, okay. Yes. Well, you know, uh, when the first time I heard, well, when the first time I heard the the topic of quantum information technology, I was mm -hmm. like talking about thinking about uh, you know, physics and computer, hundred mm. percent. And then from your presentations, I can see it's just not about physics and computer. It's about combinations of computer communications and network that can be aligned together with these quantum things. But then yes. um, I think. My questions is already been answered. Well, mm -hmm. if you can look at my chat box, uh, chat box. Uh, well, seeing mm -hmm. since that quantum is very expensive, you know how industry, just not key side, but industries locally in Malaysia can support this technology to the university and especially to our country. Okay, um, you know, I think the biggest challenge, I think it's possible for Malaysia, but I think the biggest challenge right now is to look to form a talent, a group of talent in this area because um, it's not possible just to buy this quantum computer technology. It's not possible. Um, maybe you can get some partnership from other companies. But I think first of all, you need someone locally in Malaysia to drive this quantum uh, research topic or research activities. You need somebody coming from, not only theorists, Malaysia, I know that we do have professors who are in quant who are active in quantum but it's yeah. more the theory but what is really important is we want those experimentalists so agree, yeah. yeah we need the talents and then after that once you, you build the, the maybe we call it the principal investigator then you need to pull in knowledge from physics from microwave uh, from rf from computer science from computer engineering from material you need the whole ecosystem to support it. And then uh, you need to have this group of talents. Next, then maybe local Malaysia, I would say you need a company with infinity money to support it. <laughs> infinity money. I agree. I agree on that. I agree. I have to agree on that. Yeah, because, uh, you know, that's why I did mention like Google, IBM, Microsoft. What what's the common thing in them? 
they are a cloud company, right? Yeah, they have money. Yes, they got infinity money. Yeah. So you need this kind of, uh, I mean, somebody who has the vision from the industry side, like mm -hmm. to to drive this research. Because when you say about research, we cannot put a specific timeline by next year. You must produce me a quantum computer. It's impossible to do that. It takes, uh, I mean. You, I mean, these companies, you just put in money, you don't know when it's a return. Yeah. And then from your perspective itself, uh, mm -hmm. since we're talking about uh, country and money, how, mm -hmm. how far that we still new in quantum information technology, how far we still need to go there? Because, you know, we are talking about autonomous, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, mm -hmm. data, this kind of things need a quantum. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, when we need a quantum, we also need a storage, very large storage, right? To, to store mm. all the data and everything. I mean, how far we still we need to go mm. there? I mean, I think most of the country, not in the world, are, you know, they are, we are using, we need computer in everything, especially yeah. when, you know, a lot of data is coming in right now, right? Correct, correct. So you are right, Fazira. Uh, in this case, remember, I did talk about the other types of research activity related to quantum. You need some sort of like quantum solid state devices, just like memory. Uh, I think at least 10 years, we are still, um, you will not see until actual computer, quantum computer. Yeah, maybe at least another 10 years because uh, I would say still a very early stage, but uh, we are getting there. Yeah, um, I know that you can see that Google only got how many? 50, 53 qubits, right? Their goal is to okay. go to 100. So mm -hmm. once you once you have enough qubits, then you you would like to say about commercialization. How are we going to reduce the size of like ten football field to be one laptop size or even not one phone size? Right. That at least ten years from now. But there's right. a lot of this. I would say, if you are interested to do some sort of research, maybe this is one of the potential one where be very interesting. Yeah. yeah, I can see that it's going to be a very booming uh, field, you know, when all of that, it's just not about computer, when you talk about radar, antenna, yes. network, everything is actually been coming together that can use the quantum. Yes. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. All right, I open the floor to any questions. Do you have any questions from others? Um, uh, if you are so shy to speak, <laughs> you can put into a chat room. Uh, before that... Be you know, don't yeah, don't be shy, please. I mean, I think as a Malaysian, I mean, one thing that I see, we are different from others. I mean, um, I mean, we both we speak out, don't worry about, there's no silly questions, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, I just, well, we can ask silly questions. Sometimes the silly questions you don't mean something, actually. I always ask silly questions. That's how I learn. <laughs> Okay, uh, all right, okay. Any any questions uh, from our expertise from, you know, we have expertise from Radha actually, Antena in this room. We mm -hmm. have uh, Jack just now, we have uh, Rodisha, uh, Cities Rider is on maternity leave. Anyone that want, or oh, Dr. Jimmy itself, or oh, he's on uh, mobile. Anyone that want to ask anything? Uh, anyone? <laughs> I need to go. Oh, any students? Well, maybe I'm afraid the topic is a bit too deep and everybody like got lost. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not about, it's not too deep, I think. I think probably it's a new term. It's a new thing. Quantum, you know, physics, including yeah. with the computer. And then it's turned out that it can be used with yeah, yeah. any fields of, of anything, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyone want to ask anything? Um, any students that want to ask anything? Uh, please don't shy. Uh, not necessarily. You can ask me anything. Not necessarily about quantum. You can ask yeah, about yeah. if you're interested in something else, job, career. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Anyone? Any? Anyone? <laughs> anyone? Before we going to uh, stop everything by four o'clock. Any? Any? Any questions? Any? Let me see from the Facebook if we have any questions. I don't think we have a, a question from Facebook. All right, that's good. Well, there's, if there's no question, then yeah, that's good. Yeah. Mm. 
so far no question from the facebook any anyone all right i think that's it i think daniel well i'm the one who's the most excited one in this <laughs> well okay, actually it's, it does because I, I my 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 field is in computer so i looks into you know i'll uh, expand more because everything is needs computer yeah. so of course we need computer we need something like quantum yeah, so and then of course when we need something like quantum we need something like yeah. a, a lot of storage of the words right Correct. so we need a lot yeah, of process. Of, you know, what, what i did share today is uh it's very surface um in fact hmm. i didn't even go into very detailed things um because those details things will be more involved in a lot of technical detail side uh, but again if any of you are interested in the even deeper technicality um I mean, please feel free to catch up with me or get in touch. Uh, we do have uh, experts in this quantum, uh, quantum area. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. I will give a mm. shout once I got my physics and computer coming together. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks again, uh, Mr. Daniel Yap, uh, on behalf of uh, School of Computer and Communication Engineering. Uh, for sharing your knowledge and everything in for quantum information technology, I really appreciate. And also, thank you for all the participants, for those who are coming in either from Google Meet, YouTube, or from the uh, Facebook Live. Uh, please uh, fill in the attendance and give feedback on our webinar. Uh, we're looking forward on it. Uh, before that, uh, can everyone open their camera so that we can take uh, group pictures together? Is it okay? Let's yeah. see. All right. It's only two of us that open it. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I can I see everyone's cam camera so that we can, uh, you know, uh, sharing our group 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 photo. Yeah. Right. Uh, Dr. Ong, Dr. Naima, shy shy, semua malu malu. All right. It's nice to see everybody. <laughs> Because of course you want to see uh, pictures of everyone else, right? Mm. Sorry. Okay, one, two, three. Hold on. Uh, hold on. Uh, one more. Okay, one, two, wait. One, two, three. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Daniel. I'll see okay. you around. Okay. You will come into Unimap also, right? Sometimes uh, yeah. I'll see you. Yeah, yeah. It's from time to time, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, keep in touch, okay? All right, take care. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you for your time. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thanks.